Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Schubert's last two years, the ideal list. This is a new way of doing these ideal lists, which I think is going to be very, very interesting. I'm going to be working with specific composers who were prolific, first of all, and who wrote stuff, lots of stuff, because they were prolific. Yes, right. That means they wrote lots of stuff. And we're going to do idealists of works that they did in a certain period in their life or in response to certain stimuli, rather than just doing an ideal symphony list or an ideal string quartet list. Then by doing it this way, we get to mix media. And I think that that's going to be really useful. I hope it will be useful and helpful to you as listeners, because you'll be able to focus on a variety of works by the same composer and, and all of his his or her different styles or different media forms that they're working with, ensembles and, and musical types. And you'll get so, much, I think, just a much more interesting sense or an interesting sense than you do in the other normal way of where they were at a certain time in their life across the range of music that they wrote. And I am starting with Schubert because Schubert was kind of, well, you know, amazing. <laughs> he just wrote music. He wrote tons and tons of music. Music just gushed out of him. He was ridiculously young when he died. And his last two years created an unbelievable list of stuff. And one of the other reasons I want to do this is just for that reason. Because if we take a limited time period, we gain an, a heightened appreciation of the genius of these people. Because, you know, I mean, it, it, unbelievable what they did in a short period of time, you know, almost in Schubert's case, it wasn't because he got commissions or was making a living. It just, it just happened. And wow, what a thing it was. So I've got a dozen recordings or a dozen, you know, groups of recordings, basically. And I'm going to talk about them. But wait till you see what an unbelievable list it is that Schubert wrote in his last 12 years. I mean, it's astonishing. And I have them here in, in Deutsch listing order numerical order, which uh, hopefully, which I've, I've, which I've tried to cross check against the chronological list of works, because some of the things have much later Deutsch listings, but they weren't composed in the time frame in question. And I don't want to get into an argument about what should have been or shouldn't have been. This is a very representative sample of just about all the major stuff that Schubert did in this time period, which was from 1827 to 1828. That was it. That's all we got. Two years of stuff. And he died. I was at November 1828, I think, or something like that. And it really is, it really is astonishing. I mean, putting this stuff together and listening to it again, I was just speechless at, you know, the mystery of creative genius, because boy, does this express it. So let's, let's get started, shall we? First, and oh, by the way, as with all of these idealists, and you can read it down below, it's in the description of this video, all of these performances, so you don't have to make yourself crazy. Um, you know, what matters is that there are no weak links, and there are no weak links here. Take my word for it. None whatsoever. They're all marvelous performances. We will all have our preferences. But this is a very, very strong list, uniformly. And, you know, you can go off on your own, do whatever you want, obviously. But I, I give you the list that you can work from, um, especially for those of you who don't have crazy, huge record collections. So let's start with the piano trios. I mean, there wasn't any particular reason for Schubert to write piano trios. He just decided to. And the two piano trios are, you know, huge masterpieces and classics of the piano trio literature. They are amazing works. And I just chose the Beaux-Arts Trio because they're wonderful. They're on DECA now. This was Phillips, but these were available on DECA. Um, you should be able to find them without any difficulty. You know, one of the things about the Beaux-Arts Trio, I do have to say, is because they were such a staple of the discography and they'd been around for so long and they were so good. Everybody takes them for granted. You know, I remember people looking at me with like contempt saying, oh, the Beaux-Arts trio. Oh yeah, they're doing another one. Yeah. Okay. Who cares? You know, that's, that's what you risk when you are the standard for such a long time. And what you do is at such a high level of excellence. And then you've got other groups that come along and they really set the standard for those other groups. Trio Wanderer, you know, the Raphael Ensemble and, you know, these you know, Floristan Trio and, you know, I mean, you know who I mean. I mean, just all these other trios now. And they're fabulous and they do Schubert and they're quite marvelous. 
but this is as good as any. And uh, boy, are these amazing works. I, I don't need to tell you that. You know, they're beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. So let's put this, now well, we can toss that over there because Schubert is over here, so I can put them back, back into their, their shelf when I'm done. Oh, next. Yes, the impromptus for piano. These, this is Deutsch 899 and 935. The trios are actually 898 and 929. They, you know, again, the chronology of these things is not 100% established with unflagging accuracy. So um, it, it doesn't matter if they're not in entire order. Don't worry about it. The impromptus are beautiful. Oh, my goodness. They are so beautiful. And this is Christian Zimmerman on Deutsche Grammophon. Elegant poetic, subtle, nuanced, and just wonderfully lyrical. They are marvelous performances, beautiful, beautiful works. I mean, you know, most people, most people uh, who know the Schubert piano sonatas are probably less familiar with his non-sonata pieces. You know, there's also the three piano pieces that are late, but they may have been written before these. I don't knows. And uh, it's gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. So get the impromptus and have a wonderful Schubertian time. Uh, there are eight of them, by the way, two sets of four. And phenomenal they are. Next, oh yeah, Die Winterreise, the piece you want to hear when you're in a, in a happy mood to bring it down to complete and total utter misery. I mean, Die Winterreise is one of the great song cycles. Of course, it is unbelievably tragic and bleak and despairing. And uh, as Schubert was at that period in his life when he was confronting death, and boy, this is a heavy, 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 heavy load to carry if you're performing Die Winterreise. And there are many fine versions of it. You know, it's one of those works that usually comes off very well because singers and pianists don't attempt it unless they are ready. It's treated with the sort of reverence that it really deserves. And the only question is whether it's given too much reverence, that is, reverence, that is. That is, it, it's not texturally or, or emotionally or expressively diversified enough because there's a huge range of emotion in this, in this song cycle. It's not all dismal. Um, it just winds up that way. And the performance I chose, this one may surprise you, but I, I have great affection for this performance. It's Peter Pears and Benjamin Britten. You know, they did also Die Schöne Müllerin. I love their versions of these Schubert song cycles. I really do. First of all, Britton is a fabulous accompanist, 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 and an amazing Schubertian. And Peter Pierce, well, you know, his voice is a little bit an acquired taste. It always was. It's that, it's that, you know, nasal English tenor style. There was Peter Pierce and Robert Tier. There are a bunch of them that kind of sound like that. It's a national style and it's as legitimate as, you know, the Slavic soprano, you know, Slavonsko Wobbleskaya, you know, with a voice that <laughs> can peel paint. Uh, there are many, many different schools of singing. And, and whatever you may say about Pierce's actual timbre, he was a singer of extraordinary intelligence and sensitivity as you know, his performances of the works that Britain wrote for him demonstrate. And he is here in these Schubert songs. And of course, they were written for a tenor. And so it's really good to hear a tenor singing them. And I, I think it's I think it's a very, very affecting performance. And, of, you know, having the accompanist be, you know, as, as your lover doesn't hurt either. I mean, the two of them were a real couple in real life. And so you know that the interpretation is is exactly what the two of them had worked out together. It's amazing. It's really amazing. An extraordinary, I think, extraordinary performance on DECA. And I, I, I just recommend it very strongly. But if you can't take the sound of Piers, anybody, you guys ever see that? It's on YouTube. You can see it. Dudley Moore doing the, the and his, 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 I forget who his colleague was, but they do a Piers Britain performance of Little Miss Muffet. And it is the funniest thing you've ever seen. Apparently, Britain, who had no sense of humor whatsoever, was very, very annoyed with it. But it's now, Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet, eating her curds, and way, 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 way. Well, you know, something like that. I don't know. My Peter Pierce imitation isn't quite what it used to be. And my imitation of, of Dudley or whoever was singing, doing, <laughs> you know, it's very funny. It's very funny, but this is not. This is deadly serious, and it's wonderfully done. So there you go. Next, 
Let's see. Die Winterreise is Deutsch 911, by the way, in case you care. The Fantasy in C Major for Violin and Piano. Oh, what a beautiful work this is. It's incredibly gorgeous and all but unknown. There are recordings of like Schubert's music for violin and piano. There are the sonatinas, which are really sonatas. Some of them are big. And then there's this violin fantasy. And, you know, he wrote three fantasies. He wrote the Wanderer fantasy, the violin fantasy, and the F minor fantasy for, for piano, piano duet. And it's just amazing. It's a big 20-minute single movement extravaganza. And the one I have here is also on Decca. This is, I mean, I've got like a dozen of, I just love the work. I collect it, actually. You know, I was torn between Yasha Heifetz's one and this one. But then I thought, well, you know, um, I, let's give let's give Simon Goldberg a shot because he's such a great violinist and he's he's never never mentioned nowadays. So it's Radu Lupu, who is one of the great Schubertians who ever lived, and Simon Goldberg. They're doing all the music for violin and piano. And you also have the Arpeggioni Sonata with Maurice Gendron and Jean Francais at the piano. Who you know him, right? The composer. So this is a wonderful twofer if it's still around, and I just think I just think it's. Fabulous for the violin fantasy, which is, let's see, what's that one? It's Deutsch 934. Hmm. Next, there's the piano one. That's the F minor piano fantasy for piano duet. Deutsch 940, and Radu Lupu shows up again. This is Lupu and Pariah. This is like one of the great Schubert records ever. And, and you also get the Mozart Sonata for two pianos, which is an incredible work of its own. And I mean, you know, I, I love piano duo stuff. I've said that before, and I know some of you do too. And it, it, one of the things that turned me on to the piano duo, or piano four hands, either way, is, was this record. It, 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 it's such an extraordinary performance. It's beautiful. And boy, that F minor fantasy is, is, is a, it's a work and a half. It's just glorious and dark and rich and luscious and expressive and fantastic. And... and that is just a prelude to the Ninth Symphony, the great Deutsch 944, which may be the 8th, or it may be the 7th, or it may be the 12th, or who the hell knows what it really is. But there's, this gives me the opportunity <clears throat> to talk about a recording that I just love, and that I'm sure you do too. Joseph Cripps with the LSO, the London Symphony Orchestra on DECA. There's a lot of DECA here, I've noticed. Well, they, they, they get bounced out in the next couple. Boy, is this good. I mean, what a wonderful performance. It has all of that sort of Viennese Gemütlichkeit, but also some really, really colorful, colorful balances and smart tempos and nice firm rhythms. It doesn't, it doesn't schlep at any point, but it has just such wonderful character and life to it. It's one of the great Schubert Knights. Cripps is not a conductor who most people talk about these days. He did some very fine Mozart on Phillips. He did this Schubert Ninth. He made a bunch of other records for other people, but he was not one of the major conductors out there. And this is certainly one of the major performances of Schubert's great C major symphony. So I just wanted to mention it and let you know, we all have our faves and I've talked about it endlessly. So yeah, but that was, that was out there in those last couple of years. Then, after that, let's turn to more vocal stuff. Oh, yeah, his Mass number 6 in E-flat. Now, nobody pays attention to Schubert Masses. They're great works, especially the last two, the A-flat and this one, the E-flat. The, the e and this is conducted by Nicholas Harnacourt with the Chamber Orchestra of Europe. It's on Warner. Uh, with the Arnold Schoenberg Choir and a very, very fine selection of soloists. Actually, one of the things I love about this is that the soloists don't sing until the middle of the credo. They sit it out until the et incarnatus. Otherwise, it's a choral work. Now, Schubert's last mass was another one of those completely self-willed pieces. It's like, it's like Bach's B minor. It was something he just wrote because he had to. He had no commission. He had no prospect of performance. We don't pay much attention to Schubert's large works for chorus and orchestra. So why not start here? It's, it's a very heartfelt and incredibly, it, it's simple in many ways. You know, it's just, it's a direct and expressive setting of the text. And like most composers who set the text, he leaves out certain lines like, et, you know, unum catholicum iglesiam, you know, the one holy 
apostolic Catholic Church thing, there are certain lines that just don't appear. That's true of Haydn's masses. It's true of everybody's masses. And who cares? We're not we're not listening to it for its doctrinal doctrinal qualities or rectitude. We're listening to it because it's great music. It's great late Schubert. And it's a wonderful compliment, by the way, to the, the great C major symphony. These two large works, one orchestral, one choral and orchestral. And not enough people know this music. They really, really don't. But there it is. And that's one of the beauties of doing an idealist in this way, because we get to introduce all of these different pieces that people who, for example, only listen to orchestral music or only like chamber music, they're not going to bother with. But my point is that it's all Schubert. And you should hear it all. You should hear him in his totality, without a doubt. So next, oh yeah, the string quintet. Oh God, the string quintet. Well, we've talked about that endlessly. And my choice here is the Aubon Berg Quartet with Heinrich Schiff. This is like one of my however choices um, on, on Warner now, it was EMI. It's just a great performance. The only problem I have with it is that it doesn't take exposition repeats. And I love repeats in this piece because I just never want it to end. It's so beautiful. But boy, is this a performance that just knocks them out, it knocks it out of the park especially the slow movement in the scherzo. Oh my God, that hunting scherzo. It's, you feel yourself out there like shooting things. It's just tremendous, absolutely tremendous. And the quintet, I don't need to talk about more because it is so famous that we've all talked about it endlessly. And you can look at my other videos on the C major quintet, which is, let's see, Deutsch 956. The mass is 950. The symphony was 944. See how amazing this guy was? How these masterpieces are coming one after another after another. I mean, you know, I, I know Deutsch's catalog may not be 100% chronological, but, you know, it's all within the two years, basically. And that in itself is amazing. Then we've got Schwanengesang, the swan song. Now, the swan song was not conceived as a cycle. It's a collection of songs to poetry by Relstab and Heine. And it contains some of Schubert's very, very greatest songs. For example, you've got, you've got Der Doppelganger is in here. And Amir by the Sea, these Heine settings, which are just exquisite. And you've also got the, the what you call it thingy here. I mean, you know, the what you call it thingy by Relstab. Yeah, the Krieger's Ahnung, which is one of his big settings of Relstab. And In der Ferne, In the Distance by Relstab. So these are all published together as Swan Song, the last, the last collection. And this recording is with, with Michael Valla, baritone, or Michael Fall, however he pronounces it, with Ulrich Eisenlohr, piano. Uh, and this is, this is uh, the Naxos Complete Schubert Lead Edition. I think it's worth mentioning these because these are every bit as good as the Hyperion Edition, and no one ever talks about them. No one gives them time of day, and they are really, really splendid with young, exciting singers who are really getting into the music. It's a beautiful, beautiful performance of the Schwanengesang. And I'm managing to get through all these leader things without even mentioning Dietrich Fischer Dieskau, who of course is wonderful. You know, I mean, he really is. But yeah, there's lots of other great stuff out there. And this is definitely up there. So for Schwanengesang, you can have that. And we're almost done. We've got two more to go. The late piano sonatas. There are three of them. Um, and let's see, and actually there's some extra stuff in here anyway, uh, but Polini. It's just, just a great set to have. It's so, it's so beautifully done and, and gorgeously played. And it, it's really a, re a reference tradition, a reference edition in the truest sense of the term, because they are incredibly rewarding performances all by themselves, but they also will, will teach you the piece. And so that you can hear other versions and triangulate based on, based on these and get a very, very good sense of how the music's supposed to go and what the potential is expressively for different interpretations. The sonatas in question are in C minor, A major, and the great D960 in B flat major. These are D Deutsch 958, 959, and 960. They were all published posthumously. This particular set also gives you the Allegretto in C minor, Deutsch 913, and the Dry Klavier Stucke D946, which are, you know, may have occurred in the last couple of years or may not have, I think. I'm not 100% sure. I was looking for the chronology and, you know, what Deutsch did and what the actual dates were are not exactly congruent, but it's okay. It doesn't make any difference. 
we have this set to get the last three sonatas, which were really at the end of Schubert's life now, the very, very, very end. And what a legacy it is. An incredible, incredible legacy. And these three sonatas, by the way, were composed as a cycle, particularly the C minor and the A flat. They have a lot in common musically. And so there's a, a lot to be said for hearing them, hearing them together and spending some serious, concentrated listening time, listening to all three of them. So you get a sense of, of you know, what, where Schubert was and what he was trying to do and unifying them musically as a cycle. It's really an, an amazing, amazing achievement, which again, he just did it. No one asked him. Out they came. Poof! Like, you know, Minerva springing fully formed from the head of Zeus. But last and not least by any stretch of the imagination, is a smaller work, but one that's no less lovely and kind of the apotheosis of the Schubert song. It's Der Hurt auf, de auf dem, yes, Der Hurt auf dem Felsen, the shepherd on the cliff, or the rock, the shepherd on the rock. It's for soprano, clarinet, and piano. It's really almost an operatic shena. I mean, it's like nine minutes long or something. Let me see how long it is in here. It's, it's, pretty substantial. This is Deutsch 965. Um, it's 12 minutes and 28 seconds. Pardon me. And it's coupled here with another Relstab setting, by the way, Auf dem, dem Strom, um, because they sort of go together. That's for voice, horn, and piano. So you've got both of them here, along with some Brahms stuff. And the disc in question is on Sony Essential Classics, this little budgie thing, with Benita Valente, a wonderful, wonderful singer who, you know, nobody talks about anymore, and Harold Wright, the great clarinetist, Harold Wright, and Rudolf Serkin. That is some trio to perform The Shepherd on the Rock, which was one of the very, very last things that Schubert wrote before his untimely death. And with that, friends, we've got it. Schubert's last two years. In a nutshell, in an incredible outpouring of glorious music in all kinds of different media. And this is, uh, you know, one ideal list of recordings. And of course, you'll, you may have your own ideas and you can go and do this all on your own. But just take a look at what he wrote and you can plan some listening around it, I hope. I really hope that you do, because it's going to be an enormously rewarding and engaging experience. I guarantee it. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.